so thank you everyone and welcome to our presentation. We are so glad to share this space with you on a Saturday afternoon. So my name is Regina Gong. I am the OER and Student Success Librarian at Michigan State University. And I am here to present with Rajiv. Can you just introduce yourself for a bit? Yeah, thanks, Regina. My name is Rajiv Ranjan, and I'm assistant professor. I teach in the Urdu languages, and I also teach SLA, second language acquisition courses in MAFL program during the summer. Yeah, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, so we've had our introductions already. Um, I am going to give you a brief overview of the MSU OER program. And then I'll hand it over to um, Rajiv to talk about our collaboration with the OER in Hindi, Urdu, and Kimai. And um, we'll have uh, about five minutes for um, question and answer um, for our presentation. So uh, the, the, the MSU Libraries OER program is on its third year, and I am a full-time librarian leading the program. So um, with the OER program comes an OER team, really awesome team composed of um, our publishing assistant that does uh, print on demand services. Um, we have a copy editor who does work with our um, OER authors. And then we also have an accessibility coordinator um, who does accessibility um, report for all the OERs that we are producing. And our student employee that's assigned to the OER program does uh, a lot of our uh, cover images for the OER that we create. And you'll see some of that later. So our OER award program is also part of my purview. I have an annual budget for the um, award program of, of 50,000 every year. And um, we are also an institutional member of the Open Education Network. And just this year, an OpenStax Institutional Partnership Program participant. So what are the goals of our OER program? Rajiv, just like hit enter until you get to the end. Okay, thank you. So the goals of our OER program, like many OER programs out there are really um, to uh, reduce barriers for our students in terms of educational cost. And more than that, uh, the platforms that we have encourages our faculty to adopt, uh, do adaptation and creation of, of OER. And, and to, to do that, we provide technical support for our instructors in order to implement the OER in their courses. And also, we want to influence pedagogy, right? So we want to be able to support our faculty in innovative pedagogical models that leverages the affordances of OER. So like I mentioned earlier, we have an OER award program wherein we provide an incentive for instructors to encourage them to use OER. So as you know, OERs are free, but it's not free to create them. So we award faculty and support faculty in their work. Next slide, please. So uh, these are the categories of awards that we have. So it ranges from adoption, which is you know adopting an existing OER, adaptation when you do a remix of multiple OER, and um, creation and development of new OER. So Rajiv here um, got uh creation and development of new oer uh for for the hindi textbook and of course we also have continuous improvement so continuous improvement are for those oer that um faculty want to improve upon either to create new content or create uh 
interactive exercises, more interactive exercises. And the scaling up of OER are those um, courses that will scale up across multiple sections of the course. And this is uh, the URL for the open textbook publishing site that we have. So we have Pressbooks as our authoring platform. And you can go to that site if you want to check it out. Next slide, please. And this is our latest titles. So, so far we have 10 titles here. Uh, and we have more titles that are um, slated for release this spring. And these are the services we offer. And these are the things that I work with faculty in order to support them. So as a librarian, I help them find and discover, curate appropriate OER that they are going to use for their course. Um, we provide a technology platform so that they can create the OER via textbooks. So like I mentioned, we have copy editing, we have accessibility evaluation. We provide a lot of professional development opportunities, both on campus and online, um, training for faculty, um, and also networking and professional development through, uh, through presentations in national conferences. So now I will turn you over to Rajiv to talk about his projects. Thank you, Regina. So uh, hello, everyone. As you know, what Regina just explained, without her and her support, I would not be here. So thanks to her and the OER MSU library who supports the instructor like me and teachers like me. And with her help and support, I have published the basic Hindi one last year and we are, I'm working, uh, basic Urdu one is in the copy editing and basic Kamai, which is done by the Tanak Sok. So after being trained by Regina and our library <laughs> colleagues, uh, I and here Daniel Steider, who is our little uh, coordinator and supervisor for less commonly taught languages, we also advise and help our other little instructor like the Tanak Sok. So we are on the board as a team. So me, Daniel, Vitanak and the Regina and her team from the OER side, we put things together to create this valuable material. So when I got this OER award, I was new, like in the morning, I was hearing the session, how do you use H5P? Or how do you, what platform do you use? How do you create, how much challenges it is to put the H5P and all those things. I was new uh, two years ago and I watched tons of YouTube videos and attended tons of uh, training program by our librarian and led by Regina. So I learned a lot, but then the support is there, technology is there, but then as instructor, as somebody who's creating the content, I had to decide what are the considerations I'm gonna do in my book. So the first question as in, again, in the morning session, my colleagues, those who are representing less commonly taught languages, I wanna add my voice to their concern that less commonly taught languages do not have uh, kind of trained teachers. If you speak the language, they are hired. They're also hired on a fixed term basis or not on a tenure basis. So they are just come here, teach and, and go walk your dog. So they do not have even incentive to kind of do something uh, forward looking. So what I thought maybe uh, this would help me and I know this is like the tenure and promotion. I'm not on a tenure track again, but this actually gave me a lots of uh, kind of pedagogical and um, educational and professional capital in the field. So I would say that even if it is not gonna help us non-tenure track people, but it does put us out in the, in the more open area and more collaborative sense. So the first thing I wanted to do because the Hindi books are traditional, but this is a, the pedagogy has been modernized. What should I do? Should I shake the world of my Hindi or South Asian language world? Or should I make a cer certain balance? So that was something. Can I, and then the pandemic hits, as soon as I got the, the, the OER award, then I had to think about, the people are talking about social interaction, 
can textbook itself interact with the audience? So can it be used by a standalone audience who does not have access to the language instructor? Who are my readers? Is this for little instructors and teachers? Is this for hated students or non-hated students? What should be my proficiency goal? And I come from a second language acquisition background, my PhD in SLA, Generative Approach of SLA from University of Iowa. So I could not just brush off my SLA mind and I'm thinking what should be my theoretical framework and pedagogical approaches and teaching techniques. And then if the H5P is available, can we gamify a little bit? So I thought mixed method would be a good idea. So this book, or not just this book, which is the example of Hindi that you see, but Urdu and Kamai and incoming book that also, um, and I just thanks to Regina that I also got the Persian with the Persian instructor. We are co-author of a Persian textbook. All these books have eight chapters. The first chapter is on a script because you know, like either you are talking about Persian, Hindi, or Urdu or Kamai, they're non-Roman languages, non-Roman scripts. So it takes lots of time. And then the chapter two to eight has a similar structure. It starts with the title and it announced the goals of the chapter, like can do sort of statement. Then it reviews the pre previous chapter, then there are two or three reading. Then every chapter has a study abroad section. So somebody who's preparing for the study abroad I kind of imagine conversation and situation. And it has a grammar points. And I'll tell you why I included that. And it ends with the cultural notes and extra optional online material. <clears throat> Very quickly, not much to kind of dig in about the SLA thing, but the socioculturalist and interactionism combines together. So the idea was to create something, the interactive or the conversational uh, material, which also has lots of socio and cultural information built in. So thematic wise, wise conversation, and then uh, before the reading or listening, so each reading is also audio recorded, has a closed CC, uh, closed caption for somebody who is has the accessibility issues. And then it has a pre-reading and post-reading and during reading activities defined. So the third approach is socio, uh, social interactionist theory. So if you see this example that I kind of uh, screenshot this, so you can see that there is a conversation one by one and then the right side, you will see that the, the H5P material, which you have the prompt and you can drag the correct response to that. So this is also like a helping uh, kind of a step by step. And I'll talk about the pedagogical approaches. So when I'm thinking about the pedagogical approaches, you know, the Kagan and Dylan, they talk about micro and macro approach. And when I'm trying to put it in my classroom and typically my classroom has 80% or 70% heritage and 30% non-heritage. So I cannot just avoid non-heritage or avoid heritage. So, and that's true for all less commonly taught languages in my point of view. So what I wanted to create is something mixed. So when you are thinking about the heritage or HLL, the macro would work better, which looks at the top down. So you give the authentic material and they track it, induce it to the certain level. And when you're talking about the non heritage it bottoms up, so deduce it. So that's sort of the, the methodology or pedagogical approaches that I was thinking when I was writing that book. So you saw in the previous picture when I wrote, I, I gave you the example of the conversation, that's micro. But these kind of activity or these kind of reading is macro, which is like give the authentic material or the essay sort of thing. And you can see this highlighted point or underlined words in Hindi and even in Urdu. These are the words that you can click and the groceries. So the vocabulary acquisition is also put together in that way. So there is a list of vocabulary, but also glossing while reading. So either the, if I'm a kind of a person who loves to learn in an inductive way or deductive way, it, it just try, I try to create something that fits lots of different style of learning approaches and, and, and pedagogical approaches that uh, literal teachers could have. So this is another example. You can see that the, the, there is an example based on grammar on the first H5P where there is a very concrete micro approach, one and one grammar instruction. But then you'll see that pre-reading or listening activities or even recording stuff 
where there is a task-based instructor instruction or communicative approach that I try to kind of mix and match. Now, teaching technique, I, I touched upon that a little bit deductive and inductive or implicit or explicit. So when I teach the MAFL program, which are lots of uh, foreign language teachers, so school teachers, those who take this master's program at MSU, and we do that kind of uh, accent research where they always try to do like, which, which approach is better, implicit approach or explicit approach, you know? So, and, and then they collect the data. So that was also in my mind that how do I mix it both? Because the, the result is still out, the debate is still ongoing. Some research shows that implicit is better, some research shows explicit is better. My personal knowledge about this is like, it depends on what features you are teaching. So if it is uninterpretable feature or feature that does not have any semantic contribution in the language, you can use explicit. But if there's a semantic value of certain features in the language, implicit could work. So I'm, I'm, I'm not one or the other side. I'm still, I, I love all approaches and all pedagogical approaches. So that informed my kind of how do I frame this? So you'll see that chapter six and chapter eight, I gave you the example. So if, if let's say that I'm a person who wants to teach implicitly, I will teach the reading and listening thing first and try to highlight implicitly those grammar points which are written 8.6, 8.7, 8.8, 8.8, 8.9. But if I'm a teacher who wants to kind of teach explicitly or deductively, then I'll teach the grammar first and then the reading and listening would be the more input to kind of strengthen those grammatical points or to reach the, like the, in the beginning of the chapter where they can do a statement or goals that can be reached. Gamification, so there are lots of like, I, again, I voice again with the little instructor that there's not much. And if even if there is much, I saw a, a presentation where they kind of copy the bookmarks. Oh, this is a good material, bookmark it. So there are tons of material available in Hindi, Urdu, Kamai, but it is all scattered. So I thought when I'm writing a sort of a comprehensive textbook for a semester or two, I want to kind of gamify this. So this, thanks to OER library help that the book is accessible on a phone. So if the students are taking a bus to come to classroom, they can still play this kind of drag and drop game or true or false game, and they can check their answer. And our library has also enabled our OER to hook it up with our uh, uh, D2L, which the platform we use to teach. So you can also assign it as a homework. Um, these are a couple of more example of like how we are trying to gamify this. You have already seen in today's conference, uh, many colleagues, those who are creating OER materials, they all are using H5P, I'm not unique, but this is something, the part of our, uh, all the books, which I'm and Regina, we are really proud of. Um, these are the projects. So you can see that I have basic Hindi one out. Kamai is being copy edited. We have Turkish, Uzbek, Vietnamese, and I forgot to mention that uh, we have a Persian and Augustine is here. Hopefully we can collaborate with the University of Michigan for Indonesian. And so these are the project where Regina is our kind of base. Without her, without our library, we can't do it. But then me and Daniel and the colleagues like Vetanak or Augustini, and our Turkish and Uzbek instructor, we all collaborate and we kind of a part of a family to produce something. And I'm really proud to say that our book, Hindi book at least, is being used in three different universities and people are using the study abroad program, which is American Institute of Indian Studies, because the two years study abroad program was online and they wanted these materials to kind of teach the critical language scholars or the basic basic uh, novice level students. So last words, our collaboration, <laughs> Regina, go ahead. We have two and a half minutes. Yeah, so I just really want to summarize our um, library and faculty partnership, you know, using these three C's. So communication, collaboration, and ultimately connection. So um, as what, Rajiv has mentioned, you know, he brings the expertise, not just in the content, but in the pedagogy for, for 
teaching, um, the languages that he teaches. So from the get go, what we established is our communication. So open communication and constant and regular checking in. So before this even, you know, come into fruition, we sat down and I talked to him about design. How are we going to render this in uh, press books? Um, you know, the, the outline, for, for the OER, and I think it really helped him as, the, as he designed um, this really awesome OER. And I really see it as a collaboration. So there are strengths that librarians bring into the table that can help faculty um, become more successful as they create this OER. Uh, so accessibility, all this interactive, um, exercises, making sure that all of the videos are captioned, making sure that the images that they incorporate are all openly licensed. Um, what else, Rajiv, what else did you get out of our partnership? Well, uh, everything. I mean, we just are like, you know, like in India, we say like we are child. And if our librarian want to mold in a certain way, we do have a content and the teachers are expert of their language. But as I said in the onset of this presentation that not all of us have those expertise. So maybe I know Hindi better, but some of the colleague knows the OER platform better. And, and I'm not where I'm today. I look back two or three years ago when I got the OER first time award, Regina, I felt like, oh my God, how I'm gonna do this? What is press book? You know, you know, and and thanks to hold uh, hand holding of all of us and the support that I have here with Daniel uh, and uh, you know Celta, like Emily is here. So this is like a MSU is a big family, and the key point, guys, is the lunch that me and Regina have, and we'll talk and we'll we'll decide things and how can we can move forward. So this close collaboration and sharing our expertise um, and that makes it really beautiful and it is it is good not for msu but out there at other universities in india and anywhere people want to use so i'll i'll like op just open it for questions and i'm gonna stop sharing so that people can jump in for the conversation is that okay Regina? So yeah start? sure okay. okay yeah and i just want to address carl's question question here if Obviously, we have a really great participation from our um, language faculty. Shout out to Shannon here, who's also one of our OER award recipients and really doing awesome work with um, the Russian OER. Um, yes, we are. I am working um, with faculty from different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So, so far, so if you look at our published titles. There are titles there for organismal biology, neuroscience, neurobiology. Um, we just finished our third round of OER uh, awards and we have faculty teaching um, biology, education. And so, you know, it's it's not limited to just languages, although language, our language faculty really are um, so committed in turning all of the language uh, courses into OER. But we are I'm more focused on a pedagogy. That's why we kind of shine because we just dive in like how to teach it, right? Um, but the neuroscientists, they know how to draw the concept and they're good. So so we put lots of, and, and the OER website that we, our library has is lots of uh, copyright free material for images. So I don't have to go in a, in a mire and click the picture of oranges and apples. This is the whole OER uh, <laughs> copyright free images available that I can use. And Little Door has like Daniel has put together years of years of years of collection of those material that also helps. So it, it it's a collaboration at many level at with many people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very, very much for answering that question. And if we, we have time for a couple other questions here, anybody wants to know? 
how do you actually do a collaboration? I wrote and said, collaboration is beautiful when it works, <laughs> but it doesn't always work. And so I wanted to ask you, um, what is the magic sauce, the special sauce? Or the, how do you get things to work? Is it communication or what are the special takeaways that we need? Well, I hope, I hope in your institutions, you are collaborating with your librarians or whoever um, is um, in charge or leads your OER program, because really that is a secret, you know, that is in itself the secret, <laughs> you know, if you um, harness that expertise that that librarian can offer mm -hmm. and also the expertise that of course the faculty OER um, creator can can have mm -hmm. so um, I there's there's a lot of times when I connect the faculty from uh, an external institution with the librarian from their institution because they just don't know, right? And um, it, it, really, it really is helpful for you to reach out to, to them uh, because they have uh, a lot of times the OER program resides in libraries. And so, you know, they're, they'll be really, uh, the really the people who, who right. can support you in your projects. Well, I, I'm thank you for saying that because I say that often, but it's good to hear other people join, and especially coming from a librarian. And part of this conference is to get developers to talk to other developers and share their stories. Many of them, um, I, I think what Rajid was, Rajiv was talking about, about feeling overwhelmed at first not having the technical expertise, uh, having the content experience in Hindi and Urdu or whatever, but not really knowing how to put all the pieces together. The key player is, of course, your library, your, your open educational librarian. And they exist on college campuses, and oftentimes we don't know about them. So I'm glad you're pr promoting yourself and the good work that you're doing in the libraries, because they're, they're really the glue that kind of puts these things together. 